Excellent. Okay. Well, we're live from New York, uh, <laughs> from the New York, uh, from the United States. Well, my name is Yen Mahirsi. I'm a, a senior program officer at the Forensic Training Institute, and I'm really happy today uh, to uh, be part of this webinar that Dr. Romini Har and Dr. Vince Jacopino, our medical director at PHR, uh, are going to be presenting. Um, Dr. Jacopino and Dr. Haar have recently published a report on the health consequences of crowd control weapons and um, I'm not going to lose even more time but I'm really happy that they will be presenting their findings in this webinar. So the floor is yours Dr. Haar. Thank you. We're excited to present it. We just um the report based on some of this research has come out just in the past few weeks. So we're looking forward to the end and I think you can find it um, as part of this webinar. But I wanted to go through some of the main uh, findings for the first 15-20 minutes and then uh, do questions and answers and have a, uh, an interesting discussion. So I'll just warn you that some of the images might be disturbing. Um, but Going on, hold on one second. So really where this started from is um, Physicians for Human Rights and another group called the International Network of uh, Civil Liberties Organizations, which is 10 civil liberties organizations all over the world, uh, from South Africa to England, Kenya, um, Ireland, uh, Egypt, and Argentina identifying the issue that while crime control weapons have been increasing in recent years and even protests have been increasing in recent years, we have really little knowledge about the health effects of all the weapons that are being used in these um, protests. So that's where we started. And uh, we kind of split our work into three main subjects. So we looked at the weapons and um, tried to research the history and the background and where they came from and I won't go specifically into that during this talk but we can talk about it. Um, we surveyed experts on the context, so how they're used, when, um, in what context and then finally we tried to analyze all the injuries and that's what I'll get into most specifically. So the interviews that we did were with leading human rights experts in uh, and 15 different experts from all over the world. And we asked them questions about when these weapons are used, how they're used, police practices, regulations, uh, things like that. And again, I won't go specifically into all of those details, but you can get an idea when we speak specifically about the weapons that are used that some of these weapons are used all over the world. So tear gas, which is probably the most frequently used in social protest as well as in other situations, prisons, things like that, was used in all of the countries that we looked at. So we had multiple interviewees in several of these countries, but Argentina, Brazil, Canada, Egypt, Hungary, Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories, Kenya, South Africa, Turkey, the USA and the UK. KIPs is an acronym for um, kinetic energy projectiles, and that stands basically for rubber and plastic bullets and other projectiles like beanbag rounds, sponge bullets, uh, pepper balls, things like that. And they were used in many, many countries too. This might have actually changed uh, about Hungary when the refugee crisis hit because the initial interviews were done before that. Water cannons are also used frequently in all the countries. Uh, sonic weapons are like sound cannons, and those are used in many countries. Tasers are used less frequently in protests, but often used in law enforcement and policing. Stun grenades, which are also called flash bombs or concussion grenades, have loud noises and um, a bright flash of light. This is meant to kind of shock people and cause the crowd to, dis to, to disperse. But um, and you can see that live ammunition is not unheard of for use in social protest as well. So <clears throat> what we started doing was looking at all the injuries from these weapons. 
and we attempted to do systematic literature reviews. So for those of you in medicine or in science, we looked at um, the major groups of literature, so PubMed, Scopus, and tried to identify all the literature on um, two specific weapons, tear gas and kinetic energy projectiles, or the bullets, because those had the most information. And then the rest of the weapons, they have significantly less information, so we did general literature reviews to see how many we can find. Now initially, you know, it's possible to look at all of the weapons and all the injuries that are caused in the news media and anecdotally and even in YouTube videos, you can see a lot of these. And we decided ultimately not to use any of those because we can't prove them and uh, we wanted the, the, the research that we did to be as tight as possible, so directly linking the weapon to the injury. So we ended up only using um, a, like medical literature and so that's the research I'll present on today. So again, the weapons that we discuss are these kinetic impact projectiles and chemical irritants, both of which for which we did a full systematic literature review. And then water cannons, acoustic weapons, stun grenades, the electrical conduction devices or tasers. And then if we have time for a second, I'll talk briefly about the directed energy weapons, which are one of the US military's newest inventions. So again, when we did the methodology, we know that we are underestimating injuries. This is not going to be an epidemiological study where we're looking at the number of people that are exposed to tear gas on the bottom and the total number of people with injuries on top because that kind of surveillance data doesn't exist. What we're looking at is what different people all over the world has published and so we're just getting a range of the kind of injuries that occur. And also, we're not really addressing as much as we could the, the circumstances of the injuries because this is worldwide and the circumstances are very different in different places. So let me summarize the whole thing by saying that the findings, what we found is that how these weapons are used is almost as important as what weapon was used. And I'll go specifically into what I mean by that. But that's, I think, the bottom line. So kinetic impact projectiles, as I mentioned, we have, these are sponge bullets. Um, this blue part on top is a little softer and so it's not supposed to penetrate. These are beanbag rounds, so they fire out of a, a rifle basically and then they're supposed to expand in the air. This is a rubber coated metal bullet, so you can see it has a hard rubber shell on the outside, but on the inside it's actually just lead or steel. Um, these are often used in um, Ramallah and Gaza and the West Bank. This is a different kind of plastic bullet. And then these are actually just metal bullets, shotgun bullets, but they're often used, especially in the Middle East, as uh, crowd control weapons. And so many, many of them can fire out of this single cartridge at once. Uh, and here's what we found. So total identified injuries caused by the kinetic impact projectiles we identified minor injuries and severe injuries. So minor injuries were injuries that you'd expect, things like bruising or just pain, um, and things that you would not need a medical professional for, things, uh, transient problems that would go away by themselves. Severe injuries, on the other hand, are things that you would need a physician or a medical professional to help with. So lacerations, bruises, cuts, things like that that were pretty significant or deep injuries and internal injuries and bleeding. And the range of severe injuries caused by the kinetic impact projectiles was also pretty broad. You can see that there's abdominal trauma, so they can hit the abdomen. We saw splenic injuries and liver injuries that required surgery. Head and neck injuries, almost all of them are severe. So if these bullets hit your face or your neck, they tend to um, either break the bones around your face, or especially your eyes, you can see down here. And if they hit your eyes, you're almost certainly going to lose your eye. Lung injuries, uh, skin, you can see many were less severe, but, and then bones, muscles, and limbs, we saw a lot of that as well. And just to get an idea of what we're talking about, so this is a young man in, I believe, in Nepal, who was shot by shotgun pellets. And you can see that 
he got hit all over his face, and then on his skull x-ray, you can see that they penetrated into his um, skin as well. Uh, this young man got shot with the rubber bullets, and you can see that they both caused bruising and lacerations on his back, as well as some injuries to his ear and his head. This man required sutures for a big, deep cut on his face. And this you can't necessarily see, but you see that he got quite a few injuries on his back. Sorry about that. Um, and one of them caused actually um, kidney injury because it hit so deeply and he required surgery. This, I'm sorry about how uh, deep it is, but this was a beanbag round that actually uh, penetrated into the heart and um, caused direct trauma, so he died. The head injuries can be pretty significant. You can see that they can cause skull fractures, they can penetrate inside the brain and cause significant intracranial bleeding. And this is a man who got um, a rubber bullet right through his eye. And you can see in another one that this one is stuck right inside the brain as well. So what we found ultimately about these kinetic impact projectiles is that at close range, they're uh, unreliable and they shoot really, really fast. So they can shoot as fast as live ammunition and hit as hard. And because they're bigger and they're bullets, they can basically cause as much damage as live ammunition. On the other hand, when they're shot from a long range, because of how they spin and they're not as small and um, as dense as live ammunition, they're very inaccurate. And so ultimately, either from short range or long range, use of rubber bullets and kinetic impact projectiles in a social protest is very, very unreliable. The other weapon we used is uh, that we discussed is chemical irritants. And this is not just one weapon, but um, again, a broad range. So this includes things like sprays, pepper spray is one of them. Uh, grenades that have chemical irritants and most frequently with that we've seen in social protests is canisters. So the two chemicals that we've seen most frequently is CS gas, which is typically what you see in um, tear gas or these tear gas grenades. It's a solid at room temperature and then it kind of dissipates when it ex when the canister explodes the, uh, using a thermal explosion and then it spreads into the air. What's important to remember is that it actually is a solid at room temperature, so when it hits people's skin, it takes about five or ten seconds to activate using, uh, activates on the moisture and the sweat on your skin. Uh, pepper spray is a very, very highly con concentrated form of um, chili peppers, essentially, but about a thousand times as strong as the, the strongest chili pepper. And these are most frequently seen out of sprays. And these sprays can spray anywhere between 2 feet and 15, 20 feet now sometimes. And you can see that they're very powerful and a lot of spray comes up. And these are usually in an oil. They can activate on contact and cause a lot of pain. And they typically last longer, up to 90 minutes in the skin and eyes. So the expected reaction from tear gases and chemical irritants is that obviously you get tearing, skin burning, sometimes um, laryngospasm or respiratory problems that would cause you to not want to be in that area and disperse. On the other hand, we looked at all those injuries and compared them to unexpected injuries. So these minor injuries include some of those. So transient injuries that last a brief time, that don't need medical assistance, things like that. The moderate injuries, these 17%, were injuries that were unexpected, lasted longer than usual, but did not need professional medical um, expertise to deal with. And then this almost 10% were injuries that did. And this is very unexpected because, you know, most people think of tear gas as what all crowd control weapons were used to be called, which is less lethal weapons or non-lethal weapons. And yet we found that a lot of them do cause severe injury. And the range of injuries that are caused by these is also pretty broad. So uh, the psychological trauma, there's only been a few studies on those, but this is probably vastly underestimated. Brain, skull, and spine injuries, abdomen and pelvis injuries, um, 
ear, nose, and throat is pretty common. But the most common are um, heart and lung injuries, especially because of the respiratory issues from breathing in these chemical irritants. And then most commonly, eyes and skin. Now, we expect that these minor injuries might occur, that you have a lot of tearing and pain. And we didn't include, of course, just um, anything that you couldn't physically see. But these are actual um, visually obvious injuries. But then these severe injuries include things like skin irritation in a child. So you can see that um, this entire skin is kind of irritated. The canister itself can cause lacerations when it's directly targeted at people, and that happens often. This is a chemical burn from, the, from tear gas. This is another really bad chemical burn. And you can see that all his skin has blistered and sloughed up. You can get skin allergic reactions, and this was a few days out, but you can see that. And another chemical burn. People also develop uh, second degree burns from places where the concentration is really high, and even when um, the canister can burn them. This is actually not from the canister, but from the, the, um, the chemical. And then from the eye, you can see that uh, the sprays specifically, when they're sprayed directly into the eye, can cause um, corneal abrasions and corneal ulcerations. You can see on this floor scene that the entire eye is abraded. They can also cause chemical lung injuries. Um, so a normal lung would be kind of all black and dark like that. But um, all of this is kind of a chemical lung injury. This is a 16-year-old girl who, when they did a bronchoscopy or put a camera down and looked, her um, initial bronchoscopy looked something like this. So there was significant injury, and um, a lot of the tissue in the lungs was sloughing off. And then this was about six to eight weeks later, so you can see what normal pink lung tissue should look like. And as I mentioned, the canisters are a major issue for blunt trauma and especially when they hit the delicate features of the eyes and the head and the neck, they can cause a lot of issues. So in some places, you know, when these canisters are fired either purposefully or accidentally directly at people's bodies, they can cause a lot of severe injuries. So <clears throat> what we also looked at was kind of variables for severity, severe injuries. So what makes these injuries worse and what makes them um, specifically that. So for kinetic energy to death trials, what we looked at was directly aiming at people, especially from close range, and bullets with any metal components. So either the rubber-coated metal bullets or there's some that have um, metal composite, and also these shotgun pellets can cause a lot more injury. For chemical irritants, it's things you might expect. So increased concentration or prolonged exposure can both cause a lot of injuries. Um, and using them in enclosed spaces, in humid or moist environments where they activate faster, and aiming the canisters directly at people. Um, I'll go briefly through the other weapons that we used and just mention that we looked at stun grenades so that you can see that this is a really, really bright flash. It terrifies people. Um, they can cause things like burns and lacerations. This woman, the her coat was burned right through. Um, this is a young boy that was not in a social protest, but was in his own home, and a uh, stun grenade was fired into his, into his crib. So we identified through uh, ProPublica has done some significant research on this, 50 serious injuries and deaths. And we could look at first degree injuries, like amputations, um, internal bleeding, and then second degree, like burns and trauma. So use indoors in close range use, and then also there's a lot of defective weapons out there. We haven't really discussed the manufacturing and regulation, but there's limited regulation on the use or development and manufacturing of most of these weapons. And so, you know, they're produced all over the world and the quality control is just not there. Acoustic weapons or sound cannons have been used more and more frequently since 2005. They've been used in many of the protests in the United States and worldwide. Hearing loss can be permanent. We've seen a few cases of that. And the risks really are incorrect use, so too close, too loud, or just too much. And 
from anecdotal evidence, we can see that this is supposed to be incredibly painful. This is just an example of a sound cannon. Water cannons, they can cause direct injury. They can also cause secondary injury. So here's an example of direct injury. This man in Germany, I believe, had uh, water cannons fall directly into his eyes, and he was almost completely blind in both eyes permanently. This man was shot also kind of in his head, but he fell over. And the other issue with water cannons is that more and more often we're seeing that they're injected with dyes, with chemical irritants, and occasionally with uh, very, very foul-smelling things that can cause kind of like a community shame because they're sprayed in that community. So injuries are really from the high-pressure water and secondary injuries from falls. And remember, you know, this is just cold water. So uh, cold water, overuse, high pressure can all cause problems. The dyes can also cause stigma and collective pain. The electrical conduction devices, we didn't do a specific literature review, but they've been reviewed multiple times in the past. Amnesty has a report showing over 500 deaths since 2000. And they're still counting. Um, and they're mostly used for arrest, but now they're more and more seen in protests. Then finally, I mentioned the directed energy weapon. So, most of the weapons that we're looking at, at one time or another, were developed by the military for military use. And then when that ended or wasn't allowed anymore, so chemical irritants, according to the Convention on Chemical Weapons, is not allowed to use by the military in conflict, they've transitioned over to the civilian environment. So weapons that we were using before on, in conflict against armies are now being used on an essentially unarmed civilian population. And this is one of them. So this is a directed energy weapon. Um, the most common company is called Rayathon. And this um, shield up here fires a UV ray that can go, I think, almost a mile. They were initially deployed in 2005 in Iraq, and they were never used. But there's been some kind of demonstration studies of them. And they're basically supposed to cause a severe skin burn, uh, skin a painful reaction so that people disperse. But they can't, nobody can see the, the ray. Nobody knows where it's coming from. They might, from a mile away, they might not even see this car. And so it's kind of a terrifying option. Um, and we've seen in those demonstrations, which are basically on volunteer um, military personnel, burns and that radiation is possible. They're also prone to misuse, um, especially from afar. The report that we completed has recommendations on all of these things, design and trade, procurement selection, testing, regulation, training. Obviously, these things should happen. There should be regulation. There should be better testing of these weapons. These are things that are not happening now. And then specifically, I'll talk about the use of the weapons themselves. So from what we understand and our research, these kinetic impact projectiles or rubber bullets, they really have no role in social protest. As I mentioned, they're inaccurate and unreliable. Chemical irritants, though they may have a role, would have a very, very limited role and that ultimately better training and understanding of how they're used can help people in identifying when they're best used. Medical assistance, um, and this is one of my pet things, should always be available. And what we discovered from the interview that it is often not, that people, that physicians and doctors are not often allowed to access these patients, that there's stigma against coming in and people are afraid of being arrested if they come and get assistance. And finally, accountability for their use. So um, live ammunition in most countries, you have to account for how many bullets were fired and when and who fired them from what, who's gone. But none of this exists with any of these crowd control weapons. And I think that's something that should be changed. So I'll end there. Um, this is just a front copy of the report that just came out. And I think you'll be able to access it. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to discuss now. And I'll actually maybe then uh, Dr. Icopino to add anything if you've forgotten. Well, thank you, Dr. Ha. I, I think uh, Dr. Jacopino is with us also, if he wants to add anything. And then we'll open the floor to the questions uh, that you can actually type on the webinar platform. 
Um, I also want to mention that the report itself is available as a handout. So if you click on the handout section, you'll be able to download the whole report. So uh, to you, Dr. Jacopino, you should be unmuting yourself. Can you unmute yourself first? How is that? Excellent. <laughs> oh, good. Sorry, sorry for the delay. Um, uh, thanks, Ed. And um, Rohini, thank you for doing such a wonderful study with PHR. And uh, this presentation, I think, is really enlightening <laughs> because, um, I mean, think about it. This is evidence that runs counter to this narrative that uh, these are, you know, less lethal or non-lethal weapons. That's not the case. Um, it, it, these weapons, as uh, this evidence shows, cause severe injury, disability, and death. And uh, without regulations on manufacturer distribution, um, you know, clear rules on the use of force, monitoring and accountability mechanisms, it's kind of a free-for-all. And people's right to, you know, assemble and peacefully protest is squashed in many, many countries. And, in, and as Rahini said, many times these uh, crowd control weapons are used as weapons. They're, the KIPs are lethal at close range. I mean, you can get lethality, and uh, there's actually an intention. Uh, I mean, the weapons are not used to control crowds oftentimes. They are used specifically for repression, and they are used intentionally to cause very significant harm and death. So I, I do think that there's a, a lot of significance to this evidence. It helps us uh, to advocate that uh, you know, we need the regulations on production, we need guidelines on the use of force, particularly with uh, respect to crowd control weapons, and obviously the monitoring and accountability uh, to ensure that force is used when necessary and proportionally. Uh, so I, I do think that it's, um, uh, congratulations are in order for bringing this to light. And this, Rahini didn't mention, but um, uh, this feeds into a UN process. The UN is currently trying to establish uh, best, practices, best, best practices to ensure the right to peaceful assembly. And so uh, it's also very timely. So I just wanted to add that as an overarching significance of the findings. Thanks so much. Excellent. Okay, I'll start with the first question then. Uh, Michael Geshwin actually is asking, if you were involved in crowd control in general, what weapons would you recommend, uh, actually, uh, along with having medical care available, as you mentioned? So which ones are the ones that are recommended? It's, it's a quite uh, interesting question. Yeah, this was a hard one because we looked at this and, you know, we said a lot of people had an issue of, well, if you ban all crowd control weapons, then people are just going to go back to live ammunition, and that's a serious concern in some places. Um, but I don't think it's our role to necessarily recommend which weapons are safe. It's to point out that, again, how they're used is as important as, as what's used. But I'll say that we can say one is that for most social protests, Weapons are a last-ditch choice because ultimately it's very rare to have a riot where everybody is violent and absolutely needs to be dispersed. Usually it's a situation where there's a small group that's violent or is causing pr problems, and for those, just regular policing is the best way to go. So arresting the people that are actually violent or causing problems and not just kind of uh, ending the entire protest just because of a small group. So uh, when we did the interviews with the experts and from our research, that's probably the number one thing. Number two, I'd say there may be a role for things like uh, chemical irritants in a very limited way, but again, this is really, really um, limited and not as frequently used as they are now. Because ultimately, even if a small group of protesters is violent 
or threatens public safety, that doesn't take away the human right of the rest of the protesters to continue their protest. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead to the second question. Um, and actually, it's a question from New York, from our policy intern, uh, Elizabeth Cron. And it's a policy question. So she's asking, are you seeing any political will in the countries you studied to limit the access to crowd control weapons? And this is, it could be the manufacturing countries or uh, the, the countries that are buying them. So this is very country dependent. There's some countries, and I'll point out that Ireland and the UK within our inflow network um, have done a really good job of taking a lot of the most dangerous weapons off the street. And there is political will. So the mayor of um, London wanted to reintroduce water cannons. And there was a lot of protest about that. And they haven't been allowed. And they use, actually I'll mention to Dr. Geshwin that they use another um, sort of tool which is called, uh, which is basically corralling people and making them just sit for hours. And there's issues with that as well, but there's less crowd control weapons. Um, and they haven't used uh, rubber bullets and things in years in those countries. On the other hand, there's countries where these are just really, you know, there's no political will. In terms of regulation of the manufacturing, First of all, it's really, really hard to find out information on who's manufacturing because even if you go to these company websites, um, it is not clear. The canisters themselves often don't even say what country it's manufactured in or the company because they don't want to be traced back. And because it's such a private market, they're sold in our country all the time. So um, without serious investigation, it's almost impossible to see who's doing it. And then in terms of political will to change all of this, we're hoping that with the new um, UN systems that there will be some change in the future. But right now, other than specific countries, I don't think there has been a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Rohini. My question is, are there any findings that were surprising to you? And secondly, what further research uh, do you feel would be most impactful? Where does this initial study take you next? So I think a lot of things were surprising to me. From the interviews, I think the big thing that was surprising is that, um, or notable, is that, you know, there's, this, there's a human right to peaceful assembly, right? But in many countries, the, legal, the regulations around that uh, center around this issue of notification versus permission. So, excuse me. So, kind of really, it should be a notification system where social protests should occur. And yes, because so many people are gathering in small spaces, the government could be notified beforehand so that it provides um, provides basic safety and police and things like that. But in a lot of places, this has become just basically a permission system where if um, the government doesn't give permission or if the police department doesn't give permission for that protest, then the protest is not So that was kind of surprising how frequently that happened and how this permission system has basically turned into a political system where it depends on what you're protesting as to whether or not a protest is allowed to occur. Perhaps if you're protesting against the current regime, then that would be banned. Um, but if you're doing something softer that the government approves of, it wouldn't be banned. From the actual weapons perspective, there's lots of surprising findings. I was surprised at how many injuries from the kinetic impact projectiles were severe. I was surprised that using um, rubber-coated metal bullets is still common in some countries. Um, and then really that tear gas, which is kind of designed in the 1920s, the ones that we're using now, have had so little research done about them since then. And yet, they're more frequently used than a lot of the drugs that we use in the hospital. Um, and it's really shocking that these weapons have so little research before they, think, before they just come out and are used. And then in terms of next steps, it's a huge project, but I think accountability and monitoring are huge. So if these weapons are used, then 
the police departments and law enforcement is uh, accountable for looking at what kind of injuries occur. And so the small studies that we looked at here are just physicians or doctors or hospitals or whoever kind of looking at the injuries that have come into their department. But really a surveillance system where these are accounted for, where a protest is you know, looked at, you can see how many people from there had exposure and what part of, what number of those had severe exposure or injuries would probably be the biggest next step to see how bad the health consequences actually are. Thank you. Any more questions from the attendees? Uh, actually, you can type the question in the, uh, in the section and then we'll be able to read it. Um, but yeah, what about New York? Nope. Well, I have a question. Uh, is there some specific trainings that need to be done for like physicians who would be intervening uh, along with the, the, I mean, right next to the crowd? Is there like some sort of um, either injury related uh, trainings or also the way they would expect it to behave a lot? because they're going to be subjected to the same uh, weapons, I guess. Yeah, so there's a few things. I think awareness of the kind of injuries that can happen and that these are not just non-lethal weapons is probably the most important thing. And then the second thing is there's a real occupational risk. So some of the injuries that we looked at were actually when one person who was exposed and contaminated with chemical irritants would come into a hospital and then if they didn't know, even several hours later, they could expose all the healthcare workers to the same thing because it's still on their skin and their clothing. And I think being aware of your rights is also probably uh, incredibly important. I know you can see the cover of this um, magazine is, uh, of this report is, uh, the protest in Turkey in 2013 in Taksim, Gezi Park, and in that, physicians actually set up de facto like medical clinics or tents in the area, and they have suffered greatly. Um, and I think Dr. Icapino can talk more about that in terms of uh, politically, and then having to go to jail and being prosecuted and things like that um, for actually being um, for providing health care during the protest. And that kind of thing is obviously um, a real danger because people should, no matter what, there's this principle of medical neutrality and that people should have access to this health care. Um, yeah. What about, do you find anything out about notification or differences in how police forces, armies notify people before they deploy any of these weapons? Yeah, so most of the rules say that you have to make an announcement before, you know, uh, before dispersing a crowd. So you have to say, sort of, uh, in most countries, you know, you have 10 minutes to leave this area before we spray tear gas. However, as you know, you're in a huge crowd of people, nobody's hearing it. And also, in a lot of places, there's limited opportunities for egress. So if there's only three minutes between that announcement and when the tear gas is fired, it's almost impossible for those people to get out. And ultimately, and you can see that even in this picture, some of the pictures that I showed, is that once you start firing tear gas, people aren't seeing straight, people aren't thinking straight. And so dispersal becomes an even more dangerous um, thing where people can get in there doing that. Because ultimately, that at that point, you can't breathe, you can't see, and your skin is burning. And leaving in a safe and calm manner is not going to happen. Anymore. So, can I add, Rohini? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, this is a, you know a very common problem that you know a protest is deemed unlawful simply because they you know the paperwork hasn't been done or there is you know some individual you know uh, activity that. Uh, you know, uh, violent activity on behalf of protesters. And so rather than, you know, using necessary and proportional force, uh, or in the case of people who are peaceful and, you know, they don't have, quote, the authority to protest, instead of arresting them, right, um, you, you know, what's done is this um, 
unnecessary and disproportional force where people, the, the entire crowd is tear gassed or fired upon with uh, kinetic impact projectiles. And this is really the root of the problem is the attitude uh, of, you know, using force unnecessarily and causing all this unnecessary uh, injury, disability, and death, quite frankly, as Rahini said. Dispersing a crowd, you know, you should presume that that's going to have serious health consequences, no matter what the method. So um, it, it, I think the way in which force is used and the triggers, uh, unfortunately, that the police use for uh, crowd control weapons is, uh, is just incorrect. And that's a point of entry to correct things. I have, a, I have another question, you know, uh, do you see, and this is mostly maybe for Vince, uh, do you see uh, among the recommendation uh, the opportunity to basically uh, strengthen the documentation part that should happen when physicians are treating these injuries and are you aware of like any prosecution that happened? Let's, let's think about, I don't know, Tahrir Square or Maidan in Ukraine and revolutions happen, there is a process of transitional justice, uh, these are people who are victims from state violence, uh, and they were just, um, I mean, curbed, the right to protest was curbed, so basically, can this, uh, can an effort similar to the documentation effort of torture that uh, happens during um, the post-revolutionary era should be maybe uh, inspiring, like this kind of. Uh... Yeah, thanks. Yeah, that's 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 very true, and I think our Turkish colleagues uh, and and others in Bahrain and elsewhere have a lot of experience in doing documentation work for individual cases of essentially murder, uh, or you can even make the case of torture, as our, as our Turkish colleagues have. That this is the intentional infliction of severe physical and or mental pain on large numbers of people. And so, yes, I do think that documentation is um, a key strategy or very instrumental in bringing about justice in individual cases and or in, cha in changing um, you know, state practices. Uh, that being said, I don't think that, you know, I think we know enough about the health consequences uh, of crowd control weapons and the the unnecessary disproportional use of force uh, to have solid recommendations, right? There's no reason to tear gas people who are peacefully assembled, right? Uh, at any rate, I'm, I'm just trying to say that we don't need further documentation to make sensible recommendations on, on uh, you know, appropriate use of force. Rohini may have something to add to that. No, I think that's exactly right. Excellent. Okay, well, I think we have a last question here. Uh, it says, as technology continues to advance and this weaponry becomes more dangerous, what are, the, uh, what are courses of action that human rights advocates can take to prevent this violence or challenge the entities enforcing this violence? Um, could you repeat that? Sorry, I didn't hear the beginning of it. So they're saying as, as technology continues to advance and this weaponry becomes more dangerous, what are the courses of action that human rights advocates should be taking to prevent it? Basically? Um, well, I think there's a few things. I think from the angle of actual demonstrators or protesters, then knowing the rights around it, knowing the health consequences and making sure you're safe are probably the safest thing. And knowing that really you know, when you're a peaceful protester, that you have the right to protest is very, very important. From the um, perspective of human rights advocates, I think continuing to do this research and documenting some of the injuries, documenting some of the issues around it, and then advocating around that is part of what this report is and part of what I hope is continuing to be done. And then on a larger perspective, um, legal uh, and national recourse is also possible. Like I mentioned, some countries are doing a much better job of this than others. There's a long way to go in the United States um, and in most places, but I think there's places to look to see how it's been done. 
and communication with law enforcement and training, appropriate training is one of the things that, that human rights organizations have done in other countries. So, you know, being part of the solution and helping to train some of law enforcement to understand what their role is, is um, a small step, but it's a big step. Well, it's a big step, in the field small. I think Rohini mentioned earlier about the UK and uh, a couple of other countries that have done, you know, who have been very successful in trying to limit sort of the unbridled uh, adoption of new technologies and so forth. And I, the way they've done that is to uh, create procedural mechanisms and transparency, right? That there are commissions with public involvement, um, you know, required to approve any new technologies and they have to demonstrate there's actually scientific committees uh, you know and there has to be a demonstration that in there's some improved there's an improvement uh, uh, over previous crowd control methodologies or weapons in order to adopt them and use them so I think that there are strategies that countries have used to to check you know this sort of unregulated you know free-for-all of you know, you can buy it and use it mentality. Uh, so that, I think that's an important safeguard. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, well, um, I think um, we should bring this webinar to an end and, fa and thank Dr. Ha and Dr. Jacopino for uh, offering uh, us the opportunity to ask this question and learn more about uh, the health consequences of crowd control weapons. Uh, I am also grateful for all those who attended this live and if you're listening uh, to this webinar um, or to the recorded version of this webinar, I would also want to thank you for attending it. Uh, this is basically uh, the webinar of the month of April and I look forward to uh, meeting you again in May. Thanks everyone. Thank you.